tarde. Deixa eu só arrumar uma coisinha aqui rapidamente. Boa tarde a todos, sejam bem-vindos. No... Espera aí. Perdi o hábito. Boa tarde a todos, sejam bem-vindos aos que pela primeira vez participam do Teaços, Oficina de Imaginação Compartilhada, para os que já são habituais é, frequentadores de muitos anos, Teaço está começando seu terceiro ano no seu projeto, é, e esse ano, particularmente, com uma imensa satisfação, a gente chegou à centésima edição do Teaços. Esse é o centésimo encontro de um projeto que começou no início da pandemia, há três anos atrás, e que nem, já, já falei isso aqui, mas vou repetir, é, nem na melhor das hipóteses, mais otimistas hipóteses, eu, a Luciana Chimenez e a Isa poderíamos acreditar que isso tivesse um prolongamento e uma, e uma continuidade tão grande. Mas é com muita alegria que a gente chegou na centésima edição. Ao longo desses três anos, passaram nomes importantes do campo junguiano, como... Wolfgang Gigres, Luiz de Zoya, Andrew Samuels, Mary Watkins, Susan Rowland, uh, uh, uma série, Roberto Romaninche, Murray Stein, nossos amigos brasileiros, Guilherme Scandiucci, a própria Luciana Chimenez, Carmen Lívia, Maurício Santos, enfim, uma série de nomes importantes. E a gente está aqui hoje para dar prosseguimento à nossa atividade. O nosso convidado para essa comemoração da centésima edição é o professor Joseph Cambry. Seja bem-vindo, Joe. Vou fazer a apresentação formal primeiro. Joseph Cambry ele é presidente e CEO da Pacifica Graduate Institute e ele foi ex-presidente da IAP que é a Associação Internacional de Psicologia Analítica. Ele atuou como editor dos Estados Unidos para o Journal of Analytical Psychology, foi membro do corpo docente da Harvard Medical School, no Departamento de Psiquiatria do Hospital Geral de Massachusetts. O Dr. Campbell é um analista junguiano, que agora vive na área de Santa Bárbara, na Califórnia. Ele tem numerosas publicações, eu trouxe duas que estão publicadas em português. Pesquisa em Psicologia Analítica, que o Dr. Cambry publicou junto com Leslie Sauer, e um livro excepcional dele, chamado Sincronicidade. Ambos os livros pela editora Vozes, Natureza e Psique no Universo Interconectado. Eu tive a honra de conhecer o Joe Cambry alguns anos atrás, se eu não me engano, Joe, me corrija, em 2012, num congresso da IAJS em Braga, Portugal, numa mesa em homenagem a James Hillman. O Joe coordenou a mesa, eu fui um dos participantes, então, para mim, foi uma grande honra conhecê-lo e, a partir daí, termos estabelecido um, um belo contato. Joe, seja bem-vindo. Você é o nosso convidado especial da nossa centésima edição. É, queria que você se sentisse muito à vontade. Espero que você se sinta feliz também em estar aqui conosco. Obrigado. A palavra é sua. Uh, thank you so much, Marcus. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to, uh, to celebrate the hundred. That seems an auspicious number. Uh, and thanks to Luciana and the, the committee and to Issa, the translator, um, so that we can have this conversation. I, you know, this is my subject for today is about individuation in the 21st century. And let's just start by acknowledging what we're doing here as a part of that. This kind of meeting at long distances from multiple places in the world simultaneously, seeing many faces. Um, this is not something we were adapted to in our evolutionary history. 
this is something psychically we are just catching up. This is a what some people call a post-human or transhuman world that we're now living in. And so with, with that in mind, I've been thinking about my work on synchronicity, but also how to move forward. Um, in teaching at Pacifica with the pandemic, we went from being almost all in person to suddenly going all online within three days. The state of California was closed down by our government and um, we had to adapt and everyone was very anxious and concerned, but actually we were able to thrive during those three years. Um, and so we've learned a lot about these kind of deep changing conditions. And so that's part of what I want to bring as a background to the thought. Climate change is, of course, another one. And quite honestly, there's very good evidence that the pandemic itself is the outgrowth of climate change. We can talk about that in the Q&A, but there's evidence that that has to do with migrations of species and contact with, with uh, birds and, and um and bats that, that migrate and coming into contact with new species. And that's part of how uh, these pathways for um, the vectors to um, spread have, have really turned this into a worldwide pandemic. And we may expect more of that, but uh, enough of the preliminary remarks. Let me share my screen now and um, move forward into the talk itself. Okay, so there's our topic. Um, with the 21st century, there's so much change in the last 20 years that it does feel like we are at a place where archetypal patterns are shifting. And Jung had some premonitions of that, uh, which I'll, I'll bring up. Roughly some of the areas we're going to touch on today we're going to take a look more carefully at the Red Book uh, for Jung's discovery and, and his really development of the concept of individuation and how that led then into synchronicity. It's not separate. Uh, that those are more and more as I, as I have access to the Red Book and the Black Books and I'm working with other scholars, Bodrick Main in particular, I'll mention. Um, we're beginning to see a deeper link between these elements in Jungian's thought, in Jung's thought. And that includes what he was doing with alchemy at the latter part of his life. So let's let's move in now as to give a reminder. This is going, we're going to take a tour through some of the imagery of the Red Book. And as you re recall, uh, Jung in October of 1913 had a, a falling out with Freud um, that was very difficult for both men to uh, tolerate emotionally. They went their way, they stopped um, personal communications, but they each had disruptive experiences in their lives. For Jung, about a month later, he was on a train traveling to Schaffhausen to visit his in-laws when he was looking out the window and a vision of Europe filling up with blood came to him and it was really quite unsettling. It was a waking vision, he wasn't asleep. Um, being a psychiatrist, he was quite concerned about his own mental health. Um, and then about two weeks later on another similar training journey, he had a recurrence of this. And that had really disturbed him. And he really was wrestling with whether he was on the brink of, of in quote, doing a schizophrenia as he called it. Um, but he did something rather extraordinary. He decided to use his skills as a psychiatrist. And these included use of hypnosis that he had learned in Paris uh, at the Salpetrier with um, Pierre Janet, and what he had learned about yoga in terms of breathing to calm his emotions down when they got stirred up. He could concentrate and bring his, to his breath, he could bring his emotions under deeper control. And with that, he decided to open up to his imagination. And really, this is the origins of active imagination. He began to go into his internal world, put himself into a light trance, and began to see what he would encounter. And of course, he captured this in the Black Books and then transcribed it in the Red Books. 
the most intense period was from uh, the end of November up through uh, late January into February of, of 1914. It began to settle down some, but by the end of March of 1914, Jung realized that he had to really deeply change his life. He had to really reorganize how he lived and how he thought of himself. And he's very fortunate to have had Emma Jung as his partner because she had the capacity and abilities and the finances to provide the kind of containment that he needed to be able to take the kind of deep plunge in his confrontation with the unconscious. So he resigned all of his positions uh, in the psychoanalytic world and in the university world and focused on his own personal practice and his own internal process. And this is really the key to the origins of Jungian analysis in many ways. And in that process, he began to have a series of dreams uh, that began to point the way forward by June of, two, uh, June of 1914, he had a dream of Europe becoming very cold uh, and freezing and that the leaves on the trees curled up, but they turned into grapes and had healing juices. And they're still frozen, but there's healing juices there. And he realizes he's got something to bring to society. Well, two months later, of course, in August of 1914, World War I begins. And so Jung now suddenly feels himself caught on the horns of a dilemma. Have I been wrestling with madness? Have I had a psychotic process? Or was there something prophetic in what I saw? And how do I resolve this? So he's, he doesn't like either one of those as a solution. So he continues to explore, and it takes him 15 years or so to find his way out. And that we're going to just look at a couple of highlights. So here's the very first letter of the Red Book, and it's the D of Der Weg des Kommenden, the way of what is to come. So it's a prophetic image. And you can see that at the bottom of the, the image, we have deep sea images, corals, jellyfish, uh, other things from the bottom of the sea. And then we have the middle world and then the heavenly world above. And here we have a fiery Kundalini serpent, a rising uh, crown serpent leading up into the realm of the, the um, sun and the moon and the planets. And above that to the astrological signs. And like in the Christian myth, the new star, the, the birth of a new God, that's all premised in this initial image. Uh, but let's look early on what Jung's psychological experience is. This is from the very first part of the book. Uh, he has a dream of a solar hero being pursued by a monster. And it's represented as this beetle-like creature that is pursuing the swimming solar hero while the sun is, being, is setting and being attacked by snakes. Now, that solar hero is very much Jung's consciousness of the time. So when you look at that, you say, this is somebody who's in a pretty difficult psychological condition. If we were to have that dream today, we'd say, oh, this is a, an anxiety about being overwhelmed. But I want you to also remember the beetle. It's very important as we go further on. And we can actually see, and this would have been known to Jung because the work of Wallace Budge was already published uh, in the late 19th century about the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And in that, every night, the sun was thought to go through the underworld in a death-like experience and then come back up in the morning. Um, and the new risen sun um, was the, the culmination of the night sea journey, which we now think of as a metaphor for analysis. But in that journey down into the underworld, the sun is carried on the boat, the bark of the, the gods. Uh, and every hour, a different god carries it. Well, the first one to carry it is called Kepri. It's the beetle or the beetle-headed god that carries it. And so this relationship between sun and beetle, it's, it's changed here in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, but you see that the elements are present. Now let's go on. And one of the good things when you go through the Red Book is even if we don't know the dates exactly, we know everything is chronological. So later means further in history, further in time. 
So we now move on to page 55 and we see similar images, but this time the, the boat is there and the sun is not being attacked and not falling into the depths and, and being assaulted, but is being carried really between the horns of a, what I would say a dilemma. And at the same time, a Leviathan, a creature of the depths that has almost these like um, elements in it is moving, but now they're moving together. They're moving in sync. And can you feel the difference between being pursued by something that terrifies you and learning to get into stride and working to move together? Well, that's the psychological shift that's starting to happen. Jung's getting his sea legs. He's beginning to understand how to move through the unconscious. And a few pages later on 59, he makes more explicit that horn uh, of the dilemma of the horns and this sort of fiery material, which is exactly how he was experiencing this uprising of the unconscious. And there's that solar disk. Now he gives us a clue at the bottom of the page. He writes out Hiranyagarbha, which is Sanskrit, it's for the Hindu cosmic egg. And this is just a contemporary picture of that. But now Jung's given us a clue as to what we're about. We're going to be looking at a cosmology, a new cosmology, a new way to see the entire universe. It's not just about one's own individual psychology. He's, he's working towards that. So a few pages later on page 64, we see the cosmic egg has opened. Out of it comes this fiery, burst, you can think of Agni in, in the Hindu traditions. And there's a figure that has some worship of this moment, this, this fiery moment. And we'll come back to this uh, in terms of synchronicity later on. But just in case we need another hint, Jung is a little bit of a, a playful trickster here. We see this boat in the background and now the boat with the solar disc, but the sail is up. If we go back here, no sail. Now the sail is up. And that again gives a feeling this is underway. He has the wind behind him. That is the, the spirit, the noima, is beginning to drive him forward. There's a, a sense of the journey here that is really underway now. Um, this is no longer finding his orientation, but he's now in the midst of something. And then the next area we go to is, then we know this is now 1917 during the war because he did this. This is a series of mandalas. I don't have time to go through all of them, but the mandala series was done in uh, the middle of, starting in the middle of 1917. And the first one in the series is called Fanes. This is the image from the Red Book. When I first saw this, I was struck that it had a familiar ring, but I couldn't quite figure out what it was. It took me a while, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about the story. First, some research on who's Fanes. Well, it's from the Orphic Mysteries. Fanes was the first deity to be hatched from the world egg. Here's a picture of Fanes from the Greco-Roman period around the second century of the Common Era. And this figure, of course, looks a lot like the figure of Mithraeus uh, or the Leontocephalus in Jung's Red Book. They're drawn from the same figure. The signs of the zodiac are here. So the cosmic egg is really the cosmos inside that, uh, that what was imagined as the outer skin of the universe, the, the, uh, the fixed stars of the uh, astrological um, belt. And this is the egg. This is the kind of vision. And you can see the egg being broken open with Fanes. You see the sort of fiery um, uh, eggshell uh, at top and bottom of the figure. As he goes through and finishes the first round of transformations, and they're very beautiful if you look in the Red Book between pages 80 something and 97, he comes back now to reformulate the cosmic egg, but look at the complexity that's developed over this period. Uh, and that's really rather powerful and striking. You can see the hint of alchemy here, 
all of the primary colors of alchemy are now in the egg. So that's going to be a part of this new vision. And you can see it's both in the unconscious, in the waters of the unconscious, and also above. And it's got the four functions going, four colors. It's certainly about uh, a process that's about to open and go deeper. And so where does Jung go? Well, first off, as he's going through this period, he, his comment about the mandalas is he says, during those years between 1918 and 1920, I began to understand that the goal of psychic development, this is individuation, the goal is the self. There is no linear evolution. There's only a circumambulation of going around the self. That's, this is a profound understanding and that's what's coming out of the work on the mandalas. And he's beginning to find another center in himself and that he can't fully know it, but he can um, go around it. Now, at the same time, these are not in the Red Book. Uh, just recently, in the last, about 2019, uh, the, the uh, C.G. Jung Foundation, the heirs, published the art of C.G. Jung that really wasn't in the Red Book. And it turns out that in uh, 1919, Jung had a case of Spanish flu. Uh, it's documented in this book. Uh, he talked about this with Anili Yafe. And he had a high fever, and he had a series of five or six fever dreams while he was, uh, in, you know, in in the recovery from the from the flu. And uh, one of the images that I want to focus on, he had a repeated image of a, a sphere with a cross in it, and you see it here. And in the dream, the sphere is floating in the sky. Uh, in this island landscape, and it ends up floating between and resting between two trees. And there's a sense of calm and settledness, and Jung's starting to feel that he's going to recover from this serious illness. Here's another one of the images that you can see the kind of fiery somatic experience in the body, and but he's sensing that there's something from the realm of the spirit that's also coming to meet this. Well, if we think about a concept that Jung does not yet have here, this is going to be his intuition for the psychoid. That is that which is below and above the realm, the ordinary realm of the psyche and the imagination. Now, Jung himself thought that that was an inaccessible realm, but I'm going to argue now with some examples here that Jung actually had a psychoid vision he understood something. He had a vision of his own illness that he didn't yet know, and no one knew. I mean, they knew about Spanish flu, obviously, and they knew it was viral. Uh, but what, what a virus was, was not very well understood. But let's look at that spherical image and now look at uh, some imagery from Spanish flu. These are samples that were kept from that period that were frozen. And then, then the microscopy, the electron microscope studies of that um, Spanish flu virus have been completed in the last year or two. And so we now know that this was what the shape was. That no one at the time knew. The first virus to have its shape revealed was the tobacco mosaic virus in, in the 1930s, about 1932. And here we're, we're looking at 1919. So we're 15 years almost from 12, 15 years from even the basic discoveries. And yet the form is there. And of course, it's very hard to look at this and not think about COVID and not think that there's something there in this kind of, um, it's, a, it's not the exact same family. It's a bird, it's an avine flu. Uh, H1N1 was the name of this one. And it's not identical to the SARS no, novel coronavirus we have, but it's a close cousin. And so I've become interested in Jung's relationship to this. At the same time that Jung had this, Max Weber, he was a sociologist, perhaps one of the most famous of the 20th century, um, was working on the notion during the war of what, what he called disenchantment of the world. And Weber 
two two points. First, he talks about disenchantment. That is the loss of magic. It's from the German Desauberung, Entzauberung, excuse me, the, the disenchantment, the, the, the demag- removing of magic from the world. And he saw it as a two-step process. First, with the rise of monotheistic religions in the West, um, because they brought a unified totalizing system of meaning and values. And ultimately, uh, the more um, extreme forms eliminated anything before them. Um, uh, as having any value. And so this this kind of monofocus, um, when we think of James Hillman and his kind of polytheism, you can see that it's part of the response to this kind of disenchantment. And then the second phase of disenchantment, uh, what Weber points to is that as science, starting in the 17th century, begins to make progress, it says, I don't need religion anymore. Let's just get rid of the whole thing. And so that we end up from a scientific perspective in a world where uh, there is no enchantment left at all. Now, Weber was not happy about this. Uh, he was quite disturbed. He was actually someone who pursued things around uh, the occult sciences and so forth. But in his work, he too encountered Spanish flu. And unfortunately, he caught a case in 1920 and died from it. And so he was not able to carry this forward. But there is a kind of resonance between his work and Jung's work. Uh, And I'll come back to that in just a moment. But first, what I want to show is what that might look like, this re-enchantment might look like. And so there are two places I'm going to go. First, in the red book on page 125, you, Jung, this is the one place where that uh, sphere with the cross in it made it into the red book. And that's on page 125, where we see this figure of this little Atman Diktu um, in this kind of transcendent uh, sort of link between heaven and earth, between the, the kind of transcendent realm and the earthly realm. And that this figure is this figure is a fiery figure that is somehow there. This is what led me ultimately to my understanding of that mandala series, that it goes back to the work of Ernst Haeckel. He was the, called the German Darwin. He was a marine biologist who did these wonderful drawings. And he has a whole series of jellyfish that when you look at them are very close to Jung's mandalas. And in uh, 1897 or so, the German public was introduced to a whole series of uh, monographs from from Heckel with these beautiful drawings. You can find them today on Wiki Commons. Just put Heckel's name in and you can see his, uh, what are called the art forms of nature, Kunstformen der Natur. And one of them uh, is a sea squirt, a juvenile form of, which is remarkably similar to Jung's. So what's going on here? This figure, by the way, historically was thought to be a transitional figure between those creatures who have an outer skeleton, a shell, and those creatures like ourselves who have an internal skeleton. This was thought to go between, it was a transition point. So again, underscoring the transitional nature of the image here that that I would say is viral ultimately in its uh, capacities. Now, um, what you've got is Jung, in my mind, what you have is Jung, not only looking at uh, the mythology uh, from a psychological perspective, but he's now putting mythology into science. He's giving a deep background. I think this is part of the cosmological shift to include a kind of uh, seeing the myth-making function, the archetypalizing of uh, our knowledge, not restricted from science, that it is part of science. And you can see this is part of, will lead to things like re-enchantment because it begins to bring the magic and the myth back into science. A A little few pages later, and this was this was probably done in the mid 1920s. Jung, in the Red Book, has this philosophical tree uh, with this 
uh, luminous, I would say the luminaturai, the light of nature in alchemy is being shown here. And what's striking to me is this is obviously a um, synthesis from that fever dream where the, the sphere was floating between the two trees, that he's put that together now. And if we think of that, uh, how might we interpret it? Jung doesn't leave a comment on this, but if I were to look at Jung as somebody pushing back against disenchantment, he talked about the despiritualization of the world. I think one of the most potent things that Jung ever said in this is to say, the gods have become diseases. Um, and what he meant, or at least the way we've thought about that, especially Hillman was particular on this, that our power complexes uh, are Zeus having been become pathology. Uh, Aphrodite becomes pornography in, in the contemporary world, that we've lost the sense of the sacred, the deeper um, numinous divine value. And it's bringing that back. So if the gods have become diseases for us, and Jung's work is to rework that, then is this intuition, the psychoid intuition and imagination of the viral particle in that quadrated sphere, a sphere with a cross in it, now elevated into the lumen naturae, into a source of wisdom. In a way, Jung is using the disease to recover the gods. So the gods have become diseases, maybe recovered through understanding pathology as having a divine element in it. And that kind of revaluing the experience of nature I think in a deep way, in a deep psychological way, uh, is something he's groping his way to. He does not yet have a psychoid concept. That doesn't come until the 1940s. So we're talking 30 years yet before Jung is going to articulate it as a scientific concept. What we have here is an imagistic experience uh, that we're looking at and how he's moving in that way. And a part of that, I wanted to just mention, there's a new book. I know you've had Roderick here, and I'm delighted that he has given a series of lectures on Weber and Jung and about disenchantment. It's, it's just got published in December, uh, so it's brand new. It's just come out, but it's a wonderful read. And uh, unfortunately, what I have in my uh, lecture for today was before I had access to this book. I've got it now, and I'm reading it with great delight. Um, but I'm I'm also very pleased that he and I are coming in a convergence. We see the link between individuation and synchronicity and synchronicity as the key bridge into um, breaking the spell of disenchantment. So it's a, it's a very interesting read. It's done from a scholarly perspective, not a clinical perspective. So there's still a lot of room to work with the concepts, to think about their meaning um, applied more directly to culture, but particularly to cl our clinical work, the role of re-enchantment in our work. And I'll come to some of that. So uh, at this point, we're getting to 1927, um, and Jung has this remarkable dream. I won't go through all of it. I just want to look at the end of the dream. He's in the city of Liverpool, and it's dreary and dark and miserable. He's with a group of friends and he's very struck. They go through uh, the alley of the dead and then they come into a square and he has a vision of an island with a flowering magnolia tree. And he's very taken by this. And he feels, ah, now I've found it. When he awakens, he's, he feels that he's had a vision of the self, that he's had a realization of the self in this dream which is wonderful. And he actually goes on to try to capture that in, in an image. Uh, and this is the image from the Red Book, The Window on Eternity. This is supposed to be the square in Liverpool, which is Jung interprets as the, the pool, the, the, the waters of the liver as the source of life. So it's a kind of vision of the source of life and this uh, glowing flower that's, that's there. Um, and 
so th that's that's a wonderful deep experience and we must ask ourselves okay why did didn't you stop why did he go on with the red book at this point he's had a vision of what he's looking for he's achieved what he has put, set out as his goal to begin to really have a direct experience of the self and he has it but he doesn't stop the red book not yet he goes on for a couple of more years of intensive work still and uh, it's very interesting to me. I think he's not yet got everything he needs into the concept of individuation, even though this is a key uh, element of it. What else does he start to do? Well, I'm gonna skip that one. I wanna go to the, the answer is, is back on page, it's to go forward to page 163, a year later. And he's working on the, a painting that you see on your left. And at that time, he receives in the post, in the mail, from Richard Wilhelm, who's living in Tsingdao, China, a manuscript. And he's friends with Wilhelm. He's met him at uh, uh, Count Kaiserling's uh, School of Wisdom in Darmstadt before uh, Wilhelm went to China or one of his trips back. And Wilhelm is asking Jung to read the manuscript and to, would he write a foreword or maybe even a commentary? Well, Jung's thunderstruck by this. He opens it up and this page on the right is there. Uh, and he, he's very taken by um, the parallels between them. There's something in the color. Unfortunately, the original doesn't exist. I, I've actually talked to Wilhelm's granddaughter and she doesn't have it either. So, so we don't know what the, the actual colors might have looked like, how close they matched. But there was something about that for Jung. And of course, the quadrated circle, the circle with the cross in it, is very much being, uh, again, shown in this here. And there's the thunderbolt, by the way, the, the uh, bolt of uh, the, the god Indra. But what this... Um, golden flower is, is is this Chinese alchemical text about 800 to 1000 years old. And it's all about how to cultivate the inner person. And Jung is struck by the power of parallel that he's been wondering what I've been through. This is 1928. It's been more than 10 years now. Is, is this a clue to say that what I've been experiencing is not something that I'm stuck in alone? It's not just my own idiosyncratic suffering, but it has a deeper collective meaning and that others in history have experienced it. Well, a few months later, he's giving a seminar. This is the dream seminars that are now published. And in November of 1928, at the start of the seminars, Jung has a patient who has a dream uh, with a ball in it. And so Jung is in the first session amplifying the ball, very long, elegant amplification, the history of the ball. In the course of the next week, the patient takes the ball and draws it between the horns of uh, a cow, sets it like that. Uh, from Egyptian mythology, you might recognize Hathor, uh, the cow goddess. Um, uh, this was spontaneously with no reference to what Jung was doing. He talks about this with the class, and they're also very struck because a whole number of them have had encounters with bull imagery that week out of nowhere. Here they are. It's November in, in Zurich or in Bullingen, and, and they, they have all of this bull imagery that seems almost out of nowhere. And so finally, the class stops him and says, Dr. Jung, What's going on? How do we understand what's happening? And Jung says, and this is in a footnote, he says, well, you know, in the West, we think in terms of cause and effect, A follows B because of this reason. He said, but in the East, it's different. They think of what's happening simultaneously, things that are synchronous, that occur at the same time. And the editors say this is the very first time he uses the term that leads to synchronicity. This is the origins of his thoughts about synchronicity. So it's this experience with receiving the secret of the golden flower 
that golden flower, by the way, if you think about the glowing magnolia blossoms uh, in the previous image in the window of eternity, here it is, it's showing up as now uh, the, the alchemical golden flower. And the coincidences there lead Jung to the notion of synchronicity. And he says with this, he is now able to return to the world and the world of science. He can set aside what he's doing in the Red Book. It still takes him several years to finally stop, but there's something fundamentally that sh something's fundamentally shifted. And we want to look at that shift. First, the turn to alchemy. And this, this is why the, the Chinese golden flower was so important. He says, alchemy has performed a great and invaluable service of providing material in which my experience could find sufficient room. That, that is, he had a place to begin to understand what he went through. He's no, he's not crazy. And has thereby made it possible for me to describe the individuation process, at least in its essential aspects. Okay, that's that's the personal stuff he's being able to get out of this, but he's seeing something larger. And as he articulates the synchronicity hypothesis, this is part of what he says. He says, since experience has shown that under certain conditions, space and time can be reduced to almost zero. That's an amazing statement. Causality disappears with them because causality is bound up with space, time, and physical changes. Um, and, and they're a matter of cause and effect. So that it can't be a matter of causality. Well, he's stating this, it says 1960 there, but he first started to state this in about 1948 at Aranos. This is where he first started to capture what he was doing to begin to make a cosmological statement. And that's right at the same time that contemporary astrophysics of the day was articulating the notion of a big bang as the origins of our universe, as, the, as our cosmogony, our myth of creation, as it were, our creation myth. And so what Jung is doing is saying, synchronicity belongs back here. And when you look at the physics and the mathematics of these very early states of the universe, you know, these very, very early times, in fact, there are no laws of physics. That's what you're seeing here. Um, it is this huge explosion. And then slowly the different laws of physics like gravitation, uh, nuclear forces, electromagnetic forces begin to come out, they come into existence. But Jung is saying before that, whatever synchronicity is about belongs there. So he's now placed the notion of synchronicity into the fundamental myth of uh, the modern world and of science. And this I would argue for him is also a way out of his horns of the dilemma of madness or prophecy. The way I, I myself understand that is he's saying, no, this is a fundamental property of reality. This is not Carl Jung. This is not just my personal experience. This is the fundamental nature of our universe, that these kinds of meaningful coincidences, patterns can form that can be interpreted by um, cognition to understand as meaning. That, that the origins of that go back to the very nature of reality, the way things form. And, you know, if you go to a modern astrophysicist and say, you know, pattern forming seems to be an important part of the origins of the universe, even before the forces separate, they'd say, yeah, sure, of course. Because if there was no pattern forming tendency, everything would have been annihilated. There would not be a universe. If it were completely random, for example, um, matter and antimatter would have destroyed one another. You had to have local um, inequalities, local uh, folds in, in space-time for that to happen. And that is the origins of pattern formation. So Jung had an intuition here that was very profound. We still haven't, of course, fully caught up with that. But you can see now from the Red Book how his experience there is leading in that direction. And so I wanted to say just a little more um, for the last part of my talk today, to take this notion of synchronicity as a fundamental part of individuation. That it, individuation cannot stop with just 
my personal realization of the self, no matter how profound that is, no matter how important it is. It means something more about being in touch with the nature of reality at its core, that, that individuation is part of, part of a process in the universe that we will come to. And we'll see that at the very, very end of the um, Mysterium Cunyokionis, Jung's last major work, that's where he goes. He goes to Gerhard Dorn, the alchemist, and he ultimately goes to what Dor Dorn talked about on Unio Mystica, a um, mystical union. And that was with the whole person uniting with the what was called the Unis Mundus, the, the fundament of reality, that one became um, interconnected with that. And so synchronicity is the pathway that begins to lead us towards that. So as we know, uh, Jung went on in, in 1930 at Bill Helms uh, memorial service to, for the very first time to use the term synchronicity publicly. Uh, he didn't say very much. It really took starting in 1932 when he began to work closely with Wolfgang Pauli for the two of them to really hash this out. And from 1932 to really about 1950 for them to finally get to a place where they would put forward uh, a theory of a synchronicity hypothesis. And now I think through things like complexity science, we're finding some tools that are helping us unpack that further. But a couple of features of synchronicity I wanted to just mention. I've already talked about the cosmology and cosmogony, but there's non-locality. The things happen simultaneously uh, and, and at different places. Much the way we're beginning to use the internet. There's a kind of non-locality in our communications. And for those of you who are therapists, certainly I myself and many of the people I've talked to have had experiences when the emotions get very charged, there's often some kind of breakdown in the electronics. Suddenly the picture pixelate, the sound gets disrupted. I have some stories I'm very happy to talk about with uh, synchronistic experiences as a part of this kind of non-local distributed kind of um, consciousness. And we're moving into a field model that's an interactive field, that the psyche isn't inside of my skull. It isn't just an intra-psychic event. It's, it's something not only interpersonal, that's an important piece, but also it's ecological. It connects up with the world around us. And complexity is a tool that starts to move us in that direction. So um, here's a few things about complexity. I, I, we won't have time to go through all of this, but I'll give you the basic notion here. I've talked about this before, that you have things that interact at a local level that can cre create something uh, that the whole has a, a property of the whole that you can't find in any of the individual parts. And there are lots of examples of that. Uh, water uh, is liquid at room temperature. It shouldn't be from a molecular point of view. It's the hydrogen bonding between the molecules that make it liquid. So liquidity doesn't belong to any molecule. It's not part of their, their nature. It's only the nature of the interactions that creates that. And that's a model for all kinds of things in the universe, such as the formation of stars, it's cosmic nebulae, um, or this image of uh, an ant bridge. The bridge itself, that transcendent function symbol there, is something that is not in the uh, neural system of the ants. They don't go around with pictures of that. This is the theory of archetypes, by the way. George Hoganson, who I think has talked here, has talked a lot about this kind of emergent form, that, it, that it's something happening as we engage with nature, that the archetypal pattern begins to manifest itself and we conform to it. And that's what we're seeing. It's an adaptation that we see here. The brain is very much like that. Um, and this leads to a much more complex topic than I can get in today uh, about um, rhizomal life. Uh, Jung did have some appreciation of this. He said that life is like a rhizome. And I'll show you some pictures. Um, it's a kind of very interconnected, entwined world that's underground. It's below where we, we normally see. So for example, here's some bamboo, which most of us know I have in my backyard. Looks like individual shoots coming up, but underneath, it's really an interconnected hole. 
And Jung used this as a metaphor for the psyche. I think that's extremely important to see that the way the unconscious elements of the psyche work, they're like a rhizome, which has been something that has been picked up and used. And um, in the 21st century, it's getting some very interesting um, new ideas. This is the work of Suzanne Samard. She's a forest botanist in Canada. Um, she's got a new book out a year or so ago called Finding the Mother Tree. And it's all about the interconnected networks in forests, how the trees, even of different species, are interconnected by fungi that help them communicate with one another. There's a symbiotic relationship of the, the trees give them sugar, food, and they give water and minerals back, but they also uh, make a communication network. So if the forest is being attacked by beetles, the, the tree that's under assault will send out a warning signal. The, the fungal network will spread that message out and the other trees will start to change their chemistry to become repellent to the beetles. So we've got the beetles yet again. And um, finally in this, this when, when the picture on your right was taken oh, about 2011, 2012, within three days, the picture on the left was put forward. What's on the right side is the universe at its largest scale. You're looking at clusters, hundreds of thousands of galaxies in these filaments, and they're separated. That's dark matter that's holding them in those long filaments, whereas dark energy is pushing them apart, creating voids. Well, cells in the brain, neuronal cells in the brain have very much the same structure. In fact, when I read the scientific literature, there's more similarity in the form of this than in uh, the relationship between the web and an individual galaxy or the structure of a neuron, an individual neuron and this network. In other words, this is a pattern that is repeating itself at enormously different scales, 27 orders of magnitude different between the scales here in terms of, it's huge, 10 to the 27th one in 27 zeros, difference in scale, size. Um, and yet the same fundamental pattern is there. It says something about the nature of the universe, about the nature of patterns, maybe something about the nature of minds. Um, and I think what I'll do now is I'm going to, for time purposes, I'm going to move to the um, end. Uh, we can always come back to, um, to look at cultural synchronicities and how they might fit in. But I wanted to end with Jung's last paragraph uh, from Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, because I think it picks up the feeling quality of this experience. Um, and that is that, you know, he's saying as he's getting older, he's finding himself becoming less focused on himself, less self-aware. And instead, he's becoming more and more connected with everything around him, with the world that it isn't about his inner world anymore. It's really about, and I think this is on the way to Dorn's, um, you know, sort of Unio Mystica, which in some ways Jung said he didn't think could happen uh, until one had died. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But one last thing that I, I forgot while I was going through, but we can bring it into the discussion, is the importance of the beetle. So we've seen that beetle, remember, a couple of times. and. If you'll remember Jung's most important paradigmatic case of synchronicity was about a beetle, about a beetle uh, image that um, a patient had a woman who he felt was overly rational, kind of a, in a disenchanted world, dreamt of being given a piece of golden jewelry that had, was in the form of a scarab beetle. As she was telling Jung this, he heard a tapping on the window behind him he turned around, opened the window and caught the beetle and said, here's your beetle. And that shocked her into a kind of a new opening and the analysis proceeded. What Jung didn't say there and what we can now see from what I've told you, what an impact that must have been in the countertransference. I mean, given his own history of that experience with the beetle imagery, the beetle god, we can also begin to imagine what a moment of connectedness for the two of them must have been implicitly there. 
that symbol of the beetle is one of uh, uh, death and rebirth. That's really, yeah, and Yon himself knew that the dung beetle in Egypt was, a, was meant to be a symbol of death and rebirth. And so with that, I think we're at the place of disenchantment, re-enchantment, and the, there's a good work on this from Jason Joseph and Storm, where complexity might be the path of that. So with that, I will end my remarks and turn it back over to Marcus. Thank you. Obrigado, Joseph. É... Uau! <risos> um longo percurso, mano. É... Do ovo cósmico hindu às redes neuronais. É um percurso extremamente com... complexo, denso, e acho que a gente vai ter muito para conversar. Para quem está chegando agora no Tiaços, quem quiser fazer perguntas, coloque o um nome no chat, ou chama a pessoa e a pessoa faz a sua própria pergunta para o Joe, Joseph, tá bom? Joseph, queria começar com duas questões. É... Okay. A, a primeira seria a seguinte. É, se... Vai parecer um pouco confuso que eu estou formulando ela agora. Você acha que é possível falar que ao longo da obra do Jung surgiram várias cosmologias distintas a cada momento histórico, a cada momento sociocultural, a cada momento cronológico de idade. Cosmologias foram surgindo ou a gente está falando de uma obra que sustenta uma única cosmologia mas que essa cosmologia foi se apresentando a ele ao longo dos anos, como a alquimia, como a sincronicidade, como aspecto rizomático. Queria te ouvir um pouco a respeito. Yeah, that's a it's a wonderful question. You know, Jung as a pioneer often didn't fill in a lot of his thinking and theorizing. And I think you're pointing at that. Um, I would say that each culture inflects a cosmology differently based on who we are, based on our collective experiences, our language. You know, what I say in English, what you say in Portuguese, they can be translated, thank goodness, but it's not the same. I mean, that's what poetry is. We know that. And so, the question of cosmologies are, are, it's a relational model. Jung also said that, and this was what the part I hadn't gotten to in my, my talk, that we're at a point of the changing of the gods. And so I think, you know, the way he looked at the kind of um, cosmic or platonic years pointed to large scale changes in fundamental cosmological perspectives of societies. Um, and I think those change, and I think we're at one of those moments. But I think what you're saying is that each one of those cosmologies could be looked at in depth more carefully and taken apart and seeing that they are polyphonic. There are many voices in there. They're not all identical. They give an overall synthesis that gives us a cohesive look, but that's not the same as saying that they're identical. So I think that's that's something that needs further development. And I think that ultimately as part of re-enchantment. It's our own relationship to the cosmos that will actually ultimately be individual. So that's a, that's a huge area that I think really deserves the whole cultural complex thing. You know, it's, it's been started, but I think there's much more to be done there. Um, I'll stop there and go off too much. But... Uh. Joseph, só uma segunda questão. Você mencionou a ideia de sincronicidade cultural. Podia falar um pouquinho disso para a gente? O que, que você entende por essa expressão? Yeah, um, I could, 
I could bring up the slides. I'm more than happy to do that, or I can just speak about it. What I mean by it is that sometimes there are events that occur in the lives of um, individuals that have a broader um, interaction with something that's happening in the society. One of the things I would separate here, and there's been work on creativity to look at the difference between what is novel, what's new to a person versus what's innovative to a culture. So they're obviously closely interrelated, but sometimes we have innovation that is new to everyone and it, it, it alters a pattern. Uh, it's not always such a good thing, believe me, but I've looked at a series of these in history and I've come to the notion that there are key moments, inflection points, as it were, in history where something happens of a synchronous nature. The ones I, in, in my book on synchronicity, I talked about, um, for example, the origins of democracy. Uh, it was at a time where Sparta and Athens were at war. Uh, Athens was close to being defeated and a, a new leader arose, a man named Cleisthenes. And he said, we have to do something new. And this is often crisis will precipitate um, some kind of transformation. He said, I'm going to take with the, the, the whole collective body uh, that had political uh, voice by the 500. He said, we're arranged in tribes that are based on our occupations. You know, here are the fishermen, here are the merchants, here are the farmers, and so on. There were 10 tribes. And he said, we're going to restructure ourselves. We're going to have 10 tribes, but each tribe is going to have members from each of the, the different groups, the previous tribes. We're going to restructure. Well, this was a move into diversity. And what that did, it created the golden age in Athens. They were able to then, as they thought outside of the box, outside of their normal conventions, they were able to begin to come up with creative solutions that actually were able to win, win the battle and preserve themselves. Not only that, um, but as Aristotle wrote, Cleisthenes, when he came up with this thought, the names might be very important for these. And so he sent them to the Pythia, the Oracle at Delphi, and asked her to choose the 10 names. So there was the Oracle of Apollo that gave a kind of uh, divine blessing to this whole process of reorganization of the society, out of which democracy was born. I would say that's a cultural synchronicity. That's not just a solution to this. It, it shifted something fundamental in patterns. You can look at, uh, come about 500 years ago, and this is something many of you will know about Cortez's arrival in Mexico and what he, you know, the way in which there were Aztec legends that Cortez was unaware of, didn't know about initially, but fit in. He lands in what is today Veracruz exactly on the day where Quetzalcoatl is said to return. Uh, and Quetzalcoatl is a bearded fellow. I mean, it's a very peculiar coincidence that happens and which terrifies Moctezuma. And this is a very big part of what happened with the, uh, you know, the conquest of, of Mexico. And we're still living in the aftermath of what I would call a negative synchronism. And I have more and more of them. I'll, I'll give you one more and then I'll stop because it's not in the book, I thought. In, um, in 1942, I think it was 1941-42, Stalin got interested in the figure of Tamerlane or uh, Timur in Uzbekistan. He was uh, a, a kind of distant relative of Genghis Khan and who had also uh, brought the Golden Horde on a, a series of conquests. And for some reasons, um, he sent a team of archaeologists to go and look at um, and bring back uh, the remains of, of Timur. Well, when they opened, it's in a very beautiful uh, mosque-like building. And when they opened up the crypt, there was a warning that said, he who defiles my tomb will unleash an invader worse than me. 
within three days, Hitler surprisingly uh, launched Operation Barbarossa and, and invaded the Soviet Union. Then finally Stalin had, had enough, I think. I mean, his state of mind is not known, but uh, about a year later, he sent the remains back to be reburied with full Islamic services. Within a month, the Battle of Stalingrad was won, the Soviets won that, and the, war, the, the whole course of the war changed. It's a well-documented story. I mean, it's, and so that to me is something, a synchronicity that's happening on the world stage. So that's what I would mean by cultural synchronicity. Okay. Watch, watch my day. Obrigado, Joseph. Lu, contigo. Aurea, Aurea tem uma pergunta. Aurea pediu para perguntar. Ela está perguntando antes de mim, aham? Uh -huh. Ah, desculpa, Aurea, não tinha visto, por favor. Microfone fechado, Aurea. É muito... Que prazer, Jos, te ver novamente. É uma alegria muito grande. Um, eu, veja bem, eu fiquei muito interessada quando eu tenho lido bastante de Machopoulos o conceito de Kairos. E eu lhe pergunto se Kairos, se quando eu recebo, eu, eu percebo Kairos na minha vida, consigo perceber sem julgamento, apenas acolher como algo inaudito, paradoxal, né? se não pode ser uma manifestação do self em direção à individuação. O que você acha? É uma grande bobagem que eu estou pensando? Ou faz algum sentido? Well, first, it's wonderful to see you again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. And, um, no, in fact, Jung actually talked about Kairos and linked it. And von Franz also, when she writes on number and time and synchronicity, she very much says that the, the closest concept that we have to something like the Chinese sense of the I Ching would be the notion of Kairos. Actually, Kairos itself is an interesting notion because it, in ancient Greece, its meaning changed. It, yeah. it meant, mm -hmm. you know, it, it meant um, a kind of uh, a location and then it moved into a time. It's kind of space and time. And I think Kairos is, is about the, quality of the field in synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Synchronicities are, are chirotic. It's a coincidence <laughs> in time. And it, it tells you that that space-time field that we are in it is, there's something, if I use the analogy of gravity, the, the Einstein's theory of gravity is that large bodies uh, change, they, they warp space-time. And that's why things move you know, along gravitational paths. Well. I think when there's something of a synchronistic quality, it also changes the psychic field. And that we have, that's, that's what Kairos is, is we experience in time something like this. So I, I think it's absolutely um, integral to the notion. And I, I think it could be, more could be done about individuation in Kairos. You know, the, the, it's been more about synchronicity, but I think what you're saying is, is really very, very important. I mean, people have said synchronicities are, are a guide, but I think there's even more to be found there. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada. Yeah. De coração. Thank you. Yeah. Obrigada, Aurea. Kelly, você gostaria de fazer uma pergunta? Pode fazer. Sim, muito obrigada é, por abrir esse espaço. Obrigada ao Gapsus. E... Obrigada, jo Joseph Cambray. É, várias vezes eu já te assisti, é sempre um poder poder te assistir. E eu me sinto honrada de poder estar aqui te ouvindo mais uma vez. Minha pergunta seria dividida em duas partes. A primeira seria, em que momento da epistemologia, da construção do método Jungiano, ele percebeu que o mundo é feito de eventos sincronísticos, de momentos em que os arquétipos se manifestam, em que momento ele percebeu que é, 
os deuses teriam que ser trazidos novamente, é, em razão de curar as doenças, né? E a segunda pergunta seria em como é, ferramentas terapêuticas como o um tarô, como a interpretação dos sonhos, como a imaginação ativa, podem abrir a gente de uma forma mais flexível para perceber esse axis mundi, esse unus mundus. Acho que seria isso. Muito obrigada pela oportunidade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> no, it's very good, very rich and complex questions. Um, you know, your question about Jung's realization is an extremely interesting and difficult question to get at because the collected works are written so that we have the final edited version of Jung's thoughts. We don't always have the development of the thought. This is why the work of the Philemon Foundation, I, I feel is very valuable because they're trying to give us some of the works that were done at specific times so we can figure out, well, when actually did he think this? What I told you today about the uh, philosophical tree with the Lumen Naturae, Jung didn't write that down. I'm taking my knowledge as a Jungian and reading it because I, I'm looking at his imagery. Uh, in a way, I find the imagery to be more telling. It's it's almost like when you work with art uh, in analysis, that there's a way in which there's a kind of purity of expression uh, in artwork that, that doesn't get into the kind of argumentation to try to figure out, well, is it this or that? It's just, this is how it is. And so that's why I love looking at the, the artistic work. When exactly did he realize these things? Well, with synchronicity, I can say, you know, he first says it at least out, out loud to others in November of 1928, that much we know. And then he says it publicly in 1930, but he really hasn't worked out the details until close to 1950. And I would say even at the end of his life, he's still working on this. I don't think, Much of what I'm doing actually is to try to figure out what the direction, the trajectory of Jung's thought was and pick that thread up. I'm not always interested in where he left things, but where was he going with this? How do I, how do I take this and move it forward into the 21st century? It isn't just that I want to say, oh, Jung has the answer to everything. I think he himself was extremely open and curious and searching throughout his life. Uh, right to the very end and was continuing to try to see where the ideas developed. So this question of incarnation of the archetypes, we know that the psychoid piece was not fully articulated until about 1946-47 when he wrote uh, On the Nature of the Psyche and he talks about the psychoid archetype. That's his last idea on archetypes. It's his most complete Does, does he have experiences prior to that that he's drawing on? Absolutely. And my argument is that uh, with the Spanish flu, he was doing that. He was picking this up. And I can give you many other examples of famous artists who see things in nature that hundreds of years before there's any explanation for those things occurring. They, they, and they describe it accurately. You know, there's recently been some studies about Vincent van Gogh. If you, if you look at his uh, paintings like The Starry Night, when he was in a disturbed state, the swirls in his pictures, the turbulence actually captures the physical phenomena of turbulence. It twinkles. You can't see this in reproduction, but if you get in front of the original and you look at it, the light shimmers, it twinkles. It's amazing. And some physicists have gone there and they said, my God, he's actually captured the essence of turbulence. This is something we don't yet have a way of describing, but there it is on campus, on canvas. He's actually been able to paint that. And so that to me is a psychoid imagination. It's, it's seeing into a fundamental aspect of nature and finding a way to bring it into representation. I think that's what Jung was doing with a lot of these things. I, and how do you know it? I mean. You know, if you're the artist, you don't know that you've done something like this at a cognitive conscious level, but the drive, the impulse to create and to bring that forward is something that I think we need to honor. This would be part of re-enchantment in my mind, is to begin to say that there is a, 
faculty, a function in human beings that has this to some degree lesser. Some people are even more extraordinary, but this is a part of our nature. And that is maybe something linked to the incarnation of God. In a way, it's the self manifesting that, that vision because the self is something that would have that deeper, that deeper vision. He never reversed what I did in terms of the gods um, seeing the disease as the pathway to God. He suggested it clinically because he said, you know, these have become pathologies. And so therefore, if we follow individuation, we can be released from the curse of pathology when we have an experience of the numinous. That is, we begin to get back to the archetypal godlike experience underneath that. Now, quite honestly, when I've worked on that, I think it needs qualification because I think you need a pretty sturdy ego state to be able to tolerate that encounter. But when that's there, I do think that's absolutely correct. Then that's really healing and that's transformative. So then the disease leads the way back to the realm of the gods. In that sense, it begins to open up uh, the capacity for healing at an archetypal level. And so then there's this question about the kind of axis mundi and uh, the techniques. I think our techniques are, um, they're trying to get at not only the personal unconscious, because, you know, Freudian analysis is fairly good at accessing personal material, uh, you know, especially as it's been modified in various theories, but it doesn't work when it gets to this level of the collective and the archetypal. They don't really have a theory. Freud talked about phylogenetic traces, but he never really was able to work out how that might operate. And I think many of these things that look peripheral that Jungians draw on is because they're, they're trying to find a way around. When I've worked with people who've been traumatized, I find that oftentimes certain, at certain periods in analysis, certain kinds of synchronistic experiences occur. I'm not saying all trauma, all, all traumas or all synchronicities are traumatic. It's not it. But working with trauma patients, I do find synchronistic experiences. And it's taught me over the years to see that as a part of the psyche that does not have access to language in our ordinary channels of communication, finding a way around that and beginning to bring us into this kind of dialogue with one another at a deeper level. So uh, in terms of the axis mundi, in terms of that connection uh, between ego and self, I think that, yes, these are the kind of, all the tools that we have are trying to move us towards uh, that consciousness. If we went into complexity theory, we would talk about uh, complex forms emerge. Remember that diagram of emergent forms? That occurs at the edge of order and chaos. And I think that's exactly the place where analysis can have a, a really creative impact when we can allow ourselves to be at that edge between order and chaos and not fall one way or the other. I can give clinical examples, but let's make space for some more questions. Ooh, vamos lá? Obrigada, Kelly. Uh, Joseph, super obrigada por seu compartilhamento aí das suas, dos seus estudos tão profundos aqui no nosso espaço do Chassos, eu estou super impressionada. Eu já sempre fui muito impressionada com a tua obra e fiquei muito impressionada com a tua palestra. É, tem um momento aí que você fala que o, o Jung entrou para o mundo da ciência, né? E era, foi exatamente esse o ponto que eu fiquei um pouco pensando quando eu li algum, algumas coisas aqui do seu, do seu livro, esse da psicologia analítica junto com a Linda Carter. Tem um capítulo seu, né, que você uhum. e ela juntos falam um pouco sobre essa, né, esse, essa uma certa é, validação científica, não sei se eu posso dizer assim, é, a Jean Knox é uma pessoa também que trabalha muito uhum. com isso, né, com, a, com a neuropsicologia e tal. E a minha, e eu, eu sou uma leitora ávida do Hillman, né, apaixonada pelo Hillman, que ele, ele, ele fica muito mais na arte e na literatura e na poesia. E eu, e eu, e eu me encontro muito nesse lugar. A minha pergunta é, é, é qual é a importância né, da gente adentrar nesse universo científico? que o Jung tanto se preocupou na época dele, e hoje ainda tem muita, muita preocupação com isso. 
Né? Qual que é a tua, a tua opinião sobre isso? Ok, that's, well, that's a absolutely wonderful, fascinating and very complex question. <laughs> But let me, let me start to approach it. It's our myth. It's the myth of modernity, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, you know. Um, and so if we just leave it to the scientists, then we get a disenchanted world. And I find that unsatisfying, that the best of our knowledge in some way gets reduced into these kind of um, me mechanistic and, uh, you know, sort of physicalistic forms. The question is, and I think this was Jung's return to the world of science, was science as he wanted to start to see it. He, he wanted to expand it. And so I think science here, maybe we can go back to the ancient Greek, that science is really about knowledge. It's uh, rather than a specific uh, set of theories, which is how since the 17th century we've evolved it and it's given us great you know tools uh, modern medicine and so forth and yet it's also brought us up, away from the world of the, 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 the of magic and the divine and so the question is how to reinstate that um, and i don't think we yet have a science by the way all of the work that i'm doing i borrow from science i see where it's pointing but I don't think it yet can answer these questions. But I look at the work of someone like Suzanne Simard and begins to see the way she does the forest biology. And I think, okay, this is heading in a direction that begins to feel like we can begin to find a way to see this, the deeper psyche that's operating. I think that's what's missing from modern science. And so I was also trained, my PhD was in um, uh, quantum chemistry. So I, I have a, a, an invested interest in, in bringing uh, that back in some way to understand what my, my own interest was in all of that. How do I uh, bring that to life? And, you know, uh, I knew James Hillman quite well, actually. I actually was in analysis with him for many years. And he and I often talked about these questions because he, he was very interested in alchemy. Uh, it was one of the, his consuming passions. And he, when we would get going, he often wanted to know the physical details of alchemy. He was very interested in talking about what, what exactly was this, the particularities of substances and of what the glass was and how it worked and so forth, that there was something about the kind of nature of the physical world, not to be trapped in it, not to get caught in a reduction of that, Uh, but to begin to open up and see where the imagination is. And so uh, that, for me, that's, again, uh, if Jung can have an imagination of a virus, even though he doesn't know it, well, he's there beginning to build a bridge between um, the kind of mythopoetic consciousness and what we call knowledge or science. And it, that's really the edge that I'm most interested in. And I think Jungian therapy can, or Jungian analysis can really That's a place where we are well positioned to try to develop that. So that's a short answer. Obrigada. Muito obrigada. Yeah. Obrigado, Lu. Joseph, queria abrir um pouco a questão e. Ai. Só um minutinho, uma interferência sincronística aqui. Peraí. Desculpa, mundo animal. É... Yeah. Dentro, dentro desse, dentro da, da desse mito científico que você diz que nós atravessamos, eu concordo o mito da modernidade, o mito da ciência, esse mundo da tecnologia. Hum. É, você é presidente da Pacífica, que é uma instituição que eu diria que ela é muito particular, muito sugêneres, no sentido de que ela dialoga muito com esses outros saberes. Mas, de uma forma geral, qual é o lugar que você acha que o discurso junguiano pode ter é, nesse nesses 
nesse tempo ou nessa civilização tão secular, tecnológica, racional, tecnicista? Tem lugar para o discurso junguiano nesse, uh, nesse cenário atual? Ou, ou se tiver, e se tiver, aonde é? Yeah, you know, that's in my years of being president of Pacifica, this was something that um, I constantly found myself asking. Actually, I first came to Pacifica as the provost, the chief academic officer. And one of my jobs was to sit with the chairs of each of the programs, Pacifica has nine programs. And my, at the beginning, my first question was, tell me about your program in the 21st century? How does it work in the modern world? What is the understanding? And that has been something that's carried with me throughout my years there. The thing that I've more and more come to, um, especially in the last five years with uh, the pandemic and global warming and uh, systemic racism in the US and so forth, is that the problems we're facing now are complex problems that really involve systems, large systems, where there are many, many parts and you can't reduce the problem just to a malfunction of this or that. You have to start to take a larger vision. Well, a holistic vision is at the core of Jung's thought in my mind. Jung was a holistic thinker. He really did try to grasp. I would say, for example, let's take amplification, You know, classic Jungian technique. You get a dream, you explore the personal meaning and there's still a feeling there's more there. So you start to bring cultural analogies to that, to begin to try to see if you can find something. Well, what's really going on? I believe Jung was already formulating the notion that the psyche was not just local, it was systemic, that it was holistic. And that what you did with myth is it acted like um, a dye. If you're studying cells and say you want to see the parts of the cell, the mitochondria, the nucleus, di different what are called organelles, you put a dye on them and because otherwise they're invisible. But when you put the dye on, ah, they pop out and you can see them. Well, when you hear psychic material, dreams and so forth, sometimes it's evident, but a lot of times it's invisible. But by putting a kind of amplificatory um, dye onto the dream, what you see is not just what the pattern is, but what's coming into being right now. It is, it is a way of catching what is emerging in the moment. And that is a holistic psychology of seeing what's in the moment. And I think the world very desperately needs more of that. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Dave, you think about the pandemic, uh, there's very good evidence from the Chan Center in, at Harvard that, that as we heat the planet up with our behavior, are burning fossil fuels and so forth. It makes it uncomfortable for animals that live in the tropical areas. And so they try to move to cooler places. But migrating birds and bats come in contact with these animals now, and there's no history of that. So the viruses that might be in each of these different creatures now has a chance for new hosts that wasn't there before. And this has now seemed to be the origins of COVID, but that's a, you need a holistic perspective. You need to look at the way humans involvement with the planet, the global thinking there that's involved. That requires an archetypal eye. If you're gonna see whole patterns, to me, archetypes is a kind of very convenient language for spotting those kinds of patterns. Um, and there are more and more of these things that I'm seeing that, the, the best of the directions of the 21st century are no longer to look at just individual phenomena. They're to look at the way phenomena are interacting and are interrelated with one another. And I think there's where Jung's model of the psyche, you know, he, he really said with the collective unconscious, it was made up of the, uh, the kind of whole of the archetypal world and that you, could, you really could not tear one archetype out and just Kind of analyze that separate from everything else. It was embedded. It was like a big pattern, like a huge network in which everything is connected to everything else. 
Well, that vision, I think, is one that really deserves much greater application to all kinds of problems we're facing now, um, whether it's individual psychology, but more of these kind of collective problems. I think the Jungian approach has yet to really find its full voice in dealing with the kind of community and collective and cultural problems and global problems that we're facing. And I think the psychology that's there, that's part of where the reenchantment is, that we've lost that and we keep hurting the planet and keep destroying things because we've lost the feeling for the archetypal that's in those bigger men. So that's, you know, I, I'm groping around the edges of this. I'm circumambulating as it were, uh, to try to get at uh, something I'm not quite able to fully articulate myself yet. But I, I love the thinking that's that you're raising there. So thank you. Joseph, você fala então é, tanto no reconhecimento de padrões arquetípicos, mas também, e aí eu te faço uma indagação, é, num olhar que permita reconhecer novos padrões arquetípicos? Os dois lugares. Yeah, you know, uh, I should have put this more front and center in my talk today. I think one of the shifts is that we're moving away from the kind of heroic um, archetypal pattern as, as the definer of who we are. That is the single lone genius. The more we study the history of all kinds of fields, we realize people are, their ideas come out of a, a matrix of engagement with others, uh, with one another. That's one of the reasons why whenever I give these talks, the questions are so fascinating because I find myself being moved in directions I don't anticipate. And it seems to me that that is more of what creativity is really about for all of us. So the idea of a single lone genius or the hero who goes and does this, well, I see the validity of it in many ways. I think it's, it's too limiting. I think there's something more about these kind of interconnected relationships, like that forest is more part of the new patterns that are beginning to emerge. You know, that back in Buddha's first sermon, he talks about the net of Indra. And that's an image of exactly that, of the interconnectedness of everything in the universe. Uh, and I think that's really the 21st century is bringing us, uh, whether we like it or not, into that vision. And, and the shadow of it, of course, are things like global warming and so forth. I mean, that we're connected in ways we wish we weren't, maybe. But nevertheless, we are. And so, it's how do we embrace those kinds of patterns, that kind of shift in our consciousness. Uh, and I think we're in, in flux right now. I think we don't know. The best we can do is to track. For me, I like to look horizontally, not just at what's happening uh, in terms of a vertical um, development, but also what happens at the same time, the kairos, what's in the same moment. And when we start to do that, I think we start to get a picture of where are we moving as, as a larger body? Uh, and that's something I think, uh, there's very little writing, very little thinking about that yet. Uh, I, I would invite us all to think together. When I, when I ran Pacifica, that was one of the things I asked my team around me. I said, let's learn to think together about these problems rather than just one leader with all the answers. Yeah, that's valuable. The story I'd love to tell about this is the US Navy was trying to find a submarine off of um, off of the East Coast that had been sunk at the end of the Second World War. And they tried for uh, 10 years and couldn't find it. And so they got a group of experts and they gave them all the data and they asked them each to make their best approximation, couldn't find anything. And then finally, somebody in the group said, let's put together an average of what we've said here. Turns out they were within 100 yards of the submarine. In other words, the knowledge was in the room. Everybody had pieces of it, but nobody had the whole pattern. It was only when they put, worked together collaboratively to explore that knowledge together that they could actually, and then they were amazingly able to collectively put their finger on this. Uh, and I think that's a, it's a good paradigm for 
how to think forward in terms of new patterns for archetypal forms. Essa é uma boa frase. Essa é uma ótima frase. Pessoal, temos espaço para duas perguntas. É... Aproveitem. Duas perguntas. Eu posso fazer? Não, você não. <risos> <risos> pera aí, pera aí, Lu. Tudo bem, gente? Silvio, Martinha, Sônia, Paulinha. Vai, Lu, vai você, então. Enquanto o pessoal pensa, vai vir as perguntas. Na ah. verdade, eu queria voltar para aquela inversão dos deuses tornando-se doenças, né? Eu achei muito interessante pensar desse jeito ao contrário, as doenças podendo nos levar de volta ao encantamento. É, desculpa trazer o Hillman aqui de novo, mas eu, eu, a gente pode pensar Não. isso como uma, é, uma, uma espécie de patologizar? Você acha que o patologizar do Hillman vai um pouco nessa direção? Oh, yes, I, I think that's... Uh, that second chapter of revisioning psychology was very much on my mind in thinking about this. I mean, he picked that gods have become diseases and he began to look at what is the psychology of pathologizing itself, that there's something pathological about the way in which we separate ourselves out, uh, that you're sick, I'm well, and we don't allow the interactions. This is why, as a clinician, I've always been interested in the use of countertransference, because it brings us much more into the process. It's not, I'm not having the experience for the patient, but it's it's matter of how is it impacting me, can't be separated out. And, you know, very early on, um, in the, at the beginning of the 19th century, end of the 18th, early 19th century, the German romantics Uh, were actually poets and scientists. They were very interested in the arts, people like Goethe. Um, and they looked for a synthesis. Von Humboldt, who uh, quite uh, Alexander von Humboldt, who spent a lot of time in, in South America, uh, was very interested in doing an experiment and at the same time registering his subjective experiences. He felt those two could not be completely separated. Of course, our world, we, we think we create the illusion, and I think it's a pathological illusion. And that's where pathology comes from, that kind of division of self and other. Um, it isn't that some people aren't suffering and that they, you know, they don't have illnesses that they have to work with, but it's the way in which we other them that seems to me to get us psychologically into the difficult places that we get into. Uh, and we get into a kind of disenchanted reductionism through that. So, yeah, that's. Uh, I want to write next on reenchantment, and I want to go to the German Romanticists as a as a kind of um, precursor to all of this. That they were really our forefathers, our ancestors. So somebody say that. What's awesome. Obrigado, Lu. Última pergunta, tá? Tito, por favor. Tito. Uh, Tito queria fazer uma pergunta. Bom, okay. vai ficar para depois, então. Pode, Carolina, por favor. Obrigada, então. Eu vou pegar esse gancho aí que o Joseph, então, falou sobre a literatura. Então, se vocês me permitirem aí uma ponte, né, da, da psicologia analítica com a literatura, é, vai nesse sentido também do desencantamento e do reencantamento. A gente tem visto aí, é, desde o início do século XXI, uma espécie de fenômeno, né, na cultura de massa, é, muito localizada na, no gênero da fantástica. Né, a gente vê fenômenos é, mercadológicos como 
Uh, sem entrar muito aí na questão da qualidade literária, né? Como Harry Potter, Senhor dos Anéis, é, muitas séries, né? Com, é, que trazem é, muito mais essa um, questão do mito heróico ainda, né? Desse mito do, do ego. Hum. E eu queria saber, é, Joseph, na sua opinião, se uh, <risos> o que poderíamos, né? Uh, profissionais aí da literatura, é o meu caso, eu sou escritora aqui no Brasil, Uh, qual seria uma temática né, que impulsionaria um pouco essa saída, né, essa transição uh, do mito heróico para uh, esse tema da interconexão que você trouxe e que eu achei fantástico? Sim, isso é realmente maravilhoso. Um, a couple of quick responses. One, um, if we think of something like Lord of the Rings, the figure there is the ring rather than the hero. That's another way to begin to start to, to, to invert things and say, well, what, what's the character of? Um, but I, I think the other thing that you're talking about, I saw it in James Joyce's uh, writing in, in like Finnegan's Wake, you know, where you don't have a center that functions in the way that we consciousness norm. And, and Jung had a lot of trouble with Joyce because of this. Uh, because he was himself more grounded in a certain kind of, invested in a certain kind of ego perspective. But there was a wonderful meeting between Joyce and Jung. You know, Joyce, unfortunately, his daughter was quite ill, probably in quote schizophrenic, and he brought her to Jung. And in that exchange, um, it was very poignant. Joyce said to Jung, you know, The, when I listen to her, it's not so different than what I experience in my internal world. What's the difference between the two of us? And Jung had a very poignant response. He said, she sinks, you swim. You know, and, 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 and that for me was a moment where Jung kind of broke through his own whatever thoughts about or prejudices about Joyce's writing and, and could see that there was another kind of consciousness there that had the ability. I, I think it was a moment, now that I've seen the Red Books, I have, it was a moment of recognition. This is a fellow traveler who knows how to be in this very difficult material and yet can transform it into something. So polyphonic uh, literature or writings that get at the edges of things, that refuse the binary. You know, I, you, you made mention at the beginning about the fantastic plasticity and gender that we're now seeing everywhere in the world. And what might the psychology of that be? What, what is that? We're being forced, uh, even our languages are being forced to transform away from the kind of reductive binary thinking that we have been in for so long. And what kind of literature comes of that? Well, I think there's a kind of multi-level consciousness that might be possible there. But, and I, and I find myself kind of seeking literature that maybe you've got some suggestions. I mean, Luigi Pirandello, who is six characters in search of an author, or Borges, I saw you know, a picture there. Some of his literature touches on these kinds of things. I think it's been in culture for a while. Uh, you know, the, the Library of Babylon or whatever, the, the, the kind of uh, giving voice to this kind of multiplicity. So that's, that's where I'd start. Obrigado, Carolina. Joseph, é, vou me permitir fazer a última, última, última pergunta, tá? É, vou te usar como oráculo. Joseph, é, o mundo está um caos. O mundo está um caos. Como você bem falou, desordem climática, aquecimento subindo dois graus, derretimento da, da, das, das esferas polares, correntes migratórias, xenofobia, racismo. A gente conseguiu, vocês conseguiram tirar o Trump, nós conseguimos tirar o Bolsonaro, mas a herança, o legado continua vivo e terrível, é violento. Os Estados Unidos agora tiveram, parece que, oito ou nove né, atentados é, 
domésticos. Pura... A minha pergunta é, a gente vai conseguir sair disso? A gente vai conseguir sair disso? Well, you know, I obviously don't have an answer to that, but I wonder if it isn't the question of, of finding a transcendent third position, you know, because you're you're pointing to a move into greater and greater amounts of chaos. And I, it terrifies me. I mean, when Trump started to run for office, I thought, my God, this is the rhetoric of the Nazis in the in the 1920s. Uh, the, the echo of this was was terrifying. But I also know that the move into chaos is often about breakdown of old structures that are that can no longer sustain. And are there things in our world that absolutely need to undergo a transformation? And this is the way that we have to go at it. I mean, the more we can get ourselves in line with what needs to transform and the new things that need to emerge, the more chance there is to come out of it without complete destruction. I mean, You know, this was Jung at the beginning of, of the Red Book, is going into his fundamentally psychotic-like fantasies. He didn't know he could survive or get on the other side. I mean, that was a, I think he genuinely was terrified. Um, and yet, um, to do nothing, to just avoid it and run from it, won't solve it either. So the question then is, can we find a way that transcends where we're at? And Of course, none of us have the answers. I'm looking at the tools that help us find that edge of order and chaos so that something new can emerge. But can the society do that? That's, uh, I think it's too soon to tell, but yeah, you're, you're asking the most important question of our, of our era. This whole generation is now, I think, immersed in just that question. Tá bom. <risos> Sejamos esperançosos. Sejamos esperançosos. Joseph, obrigado pela tua presença. Obrigado pela sua presença, pela sua disponibilidade. Foi um ótimo encontro. Para nós, não haveria como é, começar a nossa nosso terceiro ano de atividades do Teatros, comemorar a nossa centésima edição tendo você como palestrante. É uma honra enorme. Espero que você tenha gostado. Muito obrigado. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was such a pleasure to be with all of you. I thank you for this opportunity. And that Zoom, that we can do this, uh, and that we can have translation like this. It's, uh, it's just marvelous to be able to really feel like we're connecting and communicating. And your questions prove that to me. I mean, it's just wonderful. So thanks again. And wishing you all the very best. And I hope to see you in the future. Okay, let's sign off. A, Joseph, a rede, a rede rizomática já começa aqui. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Obrigado, obrigado pela tua participação. <laughs> obrigado. Pessoal, yes, obrigado pela participação. Aqueles que vieram pela primeira vez, sejam bem-vindos. Okay. Os que já são de casa, bom revê-los. Voltamos a nos ver no dia 10 de fevereiro com a Verena Cast, tá bom? É, vai ser uma ótima oportunidade. Verena está tendo vários livros lançados pela, pela editora Vozes. Não percam, a procura está sendo grande. Espero que vocês tenham gostado. E sempre lembrando... Há um canal do Teatro no YouTube, tá? onde, né, Lu, tem, lá, acho que 90% das palestras estão gravadas lá. Quer falar algo, Lu? É isso aí, chama Teatro o canal, e entra lá, tem algumas que não estão traduzidas, mas quem não conseguir acompanhar em inglês tem a legenda do YouTube, que vocês conseguem acompanhar, e aproveitem. É, a grande maioria está ori no original, e na, 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 na tradução da nossa queridíssima Isa. Tá bem? Espero vocês. Bom ano novo. Feliz trabalho. Estamos de volta no teatro, tá? Um Obrigada, beijo Marcos. Beijo. Beijão para todos. Obrigada a todos. Tchau, tchau.
Obrigada. Até a próxima. Isa, beijo em você, tá? Obrigada, gente. Foi incrível.